coming up on Primetime Politics Weekend, the Prime Minister's National Security Advisor. Whether you were ever asked whether the Emergencies Act was necessary? Yes. And my answer was yes. We'll hear why Jody Thomas thought the Emergencies Act was needed as we examine this week's testimony at the Public Order Emergency Commission. What more have we learned? Also, we need to act with urgency, but also purpose, and avoid rushing headlong into solutions. As COP27 comes to a close in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, we'll speak to Canada's Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, what's been accomplished and will Canada still meet its own net zero deadline. And the head of Canada's largest private sector union accuses the Bank of Canada of engaging in a class war. So this seems like a lot of needless pain on working people right now in Canada. And what we're asking is let's have a debate about this. Let's talk about it in our country. This is Primetime Politics Weekend. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Serapio. The Public Order Emergency Commission wrapped up its fifth week, and these most recent days included testimony from the RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky, the former head of the Canada Border Services Agency, John Osowski, and the Prime Minister's National Security and Intelligence Advisor, Jody Thomas, who believe the Emergencies Act was necessary in part because she was unhappy with the answers or lack of them that she was getting from the RCMP. Take a listen. There is no evidence that there was a plan. And as I noted, we had been told there was a plan multiple times. When you say no evidence, what kind of evidence would you have expected to see? Um, we would expect some level of assurance from the RCMP that the people were in place, it was executable. We don't expect to see details, that's policing. But we needed a level of assurance that yes, finally, um, the officers needed, the equipment needed, the executable strategic and tactical plan was there. The same thing uh, that had been asked for several days. Um, we didn't have any evidence or assurance that that was in fact the where we were. Well, with that, let's bring in our weekend panel to discuss this past week of testimony. Joanna Smith is the Ottawa Bureau Chief for the Canadian Press. Marsha McLeod, a reporter with the Globe and Mail, who has been covering the public inquiry since it began. Hello to the two of you. Hello. Hey there. Well, I do want to begin here with Ms. Thomas and really her inference that the, the protest constituted a national emergency in part because she was dissatisfied with the details she was getting from the RCMP. Uh, Joanna, what do you make of that testimony? A couple things come to mind. Uh, one is we had heard earlier that Commissioner Brenda Lucky had taken part in a cabinet meeting where she was apparently prepared to tell cabinet that police did have a plan in place and she did not think all tools had been ex exhausted, she said, before the Emergencies Act would be needed. And then she said she never got the chance to actually speak at that meeting or share that information. And Jody Thomas was, uh, you know, the impression she gave was that, you know, the commissioner of the RCMP, if she's sitting on that kind of information that may be so crucial to whether or not we move ahead with this history making decision, maybe she should have spoken up. You could tell there was a bit of um, surprise at her, at Lucky's characterization of events. So that stood out to me. And the other thing is that it seemed really that Jody Thomas was doing her own research. And, you know, in one respect, I would expect a national security advisor to be doing her own research and asking tough questions. But CSIS had, had come back and said the protests did not meet the threshold for a national security emergency. And her sense really was that was outdated. This legislation had been designed in the 1980s. Things had moved on on the national security front then, and maybe they needed to take a more modernized approach to their understanding of the threats. But I, I you know, I saw yesterday in response to that, Ian Brody, a former chief of staff to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, called that a novel doctrine, you know, acting on legislation in terms of the amendments you'd like to see one day rather than the legislation as it is now. So those are some things that really stood out to me as we started trying to piece together why was this needed? Was this needed? Is this something they felt forced to do or something that they 
maybe ended up deciding was a good idea and tried to reverse engineer things after the fact. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's build up on both those points, and, and let's begin with the latter, because Marsha, even before uh, Ms. Thomas took the stand, uh, emails that she did write that were entered as evidence to the commission, in those emails you can see that she clearly stated that the protest did present a threat to democracy and the rule of law. Did she back up that assessment in any way? When she was asked about those emails by commission counsel, she, she kind of moved to the points of there was anti-government sentiment. That sentiment was building. Um, she said that people were preparing to be violent. She said this was being seen on social media. And later, I think she really built upon this, I think, sort of landscape she was trying to present, I think, in terms of, um, and which we've heard about from a number of other witnesses as well, about rising anti-government sentiment, specifically rising anger against the prime minister. Um, we've heard about uh, significant anger against the federal minister of transportation. Um, and I think that, you know, she, when she was asked about those emails, she was sort of saying it was a last formal effort um, to really get that threat assessment in place. She said others were going on and she actually ended up saying it, it to her understanding it, it went nowhere. But at the end of the day, the Emergencies Act, it doesn't actually look, it isn't defined by uh, threats to democracy and the rule of law. Um, its standard is, is there a national security threat as defined by the CSIS Act? And obviously, as Joanna said, we've heard that uh, CSIS has advised there was not a national security threat per their definition. So it is really a, a, a little bit of a shifting uh, shifting of the goalpost in terms of what is actually legally required. And, and she very much said um, the lawyers are going to be speaking on this. She was uh, hesitant to speak too much to, to that legal standard. Mm -hmm. So something that we'll, we'll keep tracking. But let's build up on the other point because, you know, Joanna, you referenced it. And, you know, earlier in the week we did hear from the RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky. And one of the more interesting points, as you said, has to do with her belief that not all options had been exhausted before the Emergencies Act was in invoked even though she did not share that assessment with the higher-ups. Uh, let's take a listen to that part of the testimony. Did it occur to you that you should make sure that government was aware of your views on these points before it came to land on the invocation of the Emergencies Act? I guess in hindsight, yeah, that might have been something significant, uh, honestly. Um, there was so much information going back and forth. I'm not sure, you know, where they were at in in the invocation. You know, Joanna, going through the editorial pages uh, in, in the days after Brenda Lucky made her appearance, there there were a lot of people scratching their heads, it seems, at the things that they learned from her. What did you make uh, of that testimony from Brenda Lucky? I really felt like I wanted to be more of a fly on the wall in that meeting for, for many different reasons, but, but one of them really is to try and figure out why she didn't speak up. That information is so important. So a couple of things come to mind. Maybe it's the culture of those meetings. Maybe she felt like it really was a place that you're not supposed to speak until spoken to. I don't, I don't know. I'm not at that table. That's not how meetings of political journalists work. Um, definitely people are always speaking up at all times. And the other thing is perhaps, I don't want to read her mind, but maybe it just became really clear by that point that things had moved along so far that this was happening and maybe this information um, that in hindsight she thinks is quite significant, I still can't get over that quote, um, was not actually, she didn't have a compelling reason to share it at the time. The, the other thing I found really interesting about her testimony is there's been a lot of talk about the notion of political interference between the Liberal government and the RCMP over the past couple of years. Um, we saw that obviously in stories about that emerged from another inquiry into the Nova Scotia mass shooting. Um, and so she was sort of asked about that. Like it's essentially, it's okay for cabinet to give administrative directives to the RCMP. It's not okay to interfere in operations. And, and she was asked whether it was time for maybe some more clarity on that. And I, she did say something interesting, which essentially was, was yes, maybe it is time to write this down. Maybe there is, there does need to be a really clear, do this, this is okay, do not do this, this is not okay sort of um, direction that can help clarify these things because it seems to be that we just keep landing back at this particular point. Mm -hmm. uh, Marsha, what did you make of the testimony? Did, did Brenda Lucky shed any kind of light for you uh, on the process behind the scenes? I mean, I think 
actually the things she didn't shed light on were very illuminating. Um, for instance, she was asked about a number of Teams messages and, and asked, what did you mean when this person said this comment or when we see this happening? And she said more than once to commission counsel, I, I can't help you. I'm, I'm not sure what that refers to. I'm paraphrasing obviously, but she, she was, was really unable to explain a number of messages that she was very directly involved in. I was also quite surprised to hear her say that she had not been familiar with the Emergencies Act. And additionally, that she wasn't familiar with police services boards, which I think folks in Ontario were probably quite familiar with the fact that it's an oversight body for police services, such as you know, Ottawa Police, Toronto Police Service. Um, she also mentioned she wasn't familiar with um, Ontario's Police Services Act. Um, so some of these things were pretty surprising to me. Um, and I think one of the things that I also found really interesting from the exchange in terms of her not speaking up at those really crucial final hour meetings um, before the act was actually invoked is that in her speaking notes, which we got a copy of during this, this commission, it's been really incredible to see some of these documents behind the scenes, but her speaking notes describe that there was a very likely timeline for the blockade of the Ambassador Bridge uh, to be opened that same evening. However, in the meeting that she's at, that she does not speak at, um, public safety minister says there's no definitive timeline for reopening that bridge. And, and that bridge we know was a huge sticking point for the government. It was costing millions in lost trade. And so that discrepancy between what she was prepared to share and then what actually was said in that meeting to me is, is, is pretty baffling. Yeah, and of course, this is all for Justice Rouleau to put together at the end of the day. But we're going to keep watching this. It's been a very interesting week at the commission, including uh, that, that email that had a death threat against the prime minister. So listen, a lot more to talk about, but I'm going to pause the conversation for now. Uh, that was the week that was. But uh, we're now going to head into the last week of testimony for the commission. And of course, among the expected witnesses will be the prime minister. So Joanna, Marcia, stay there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later in the program about the upcoming testimony testimonies from the government uh, ministers themselves. So thank you for now. COP27, the UN Conference on Climate Change, comes to an end this weekend in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. It's a conference that was not without its struggles and disagreements as nearly 200 countries came together for an annual meeting focused on the challenges of rising temperatures and their impacts around the world. Now, for Canada, it was this country's chance to recommit to the government's own stated goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050 and urging other countries to adopt policies like the carbon tax that's been implemented here in Canada. Well, we're now joined by the Environment and Climate Change Minister Stephen Gilbeau. He joins us from the site of the COP27 conference in Egypt. Minister, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Michael. Going into this, you are urging other countries to adopt carbon pricing the way Canada has, uh, really as a means of addressing climate change. But I also think it's fair to say that there are many Canadians who are still not convinced that carbon pricing works. Uh, their bills are going up, but Canadians are still using gas to get around, uh, to heat their homes. Uh, carbon is a byproduct of agricultural production. What do you say to Canadians who are still doubtful, if not resentful, about carbon pricing? Well, the first thing is that um, carbon pricing is known to be one, if not the most effective measures to fight climate pollution. And, 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 and we know that climate change is impacting Canadians more and more. And it, it's, as we've seen with Fiona, for example, in, Atl in Atlantic Canada, it's costing lives uh, and it's costing Canadians billions of dollars every year. And, and, and one of the things that uh, on the international scene here in Charmel Shape, one of, one of the features of the, of the Canadian pricing system, the uh, carbon pricing system, that, that, that is attracting a lot of attention is the fact that we, we recycle 90% of the revenues from the system back to, 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 to Canadians. And, and those Canadians get more money back from the federal government than what it's costing them for, for, for the pricing system. So they're better off with it than without it. Uh, and, and for countries, I've been talking, for example, to, uh, to, to, to a country like Colombia or Chile uh, or even the, the Brazilian transition government, the, the, the new Lula government, who really like this idea of, of, of using people who have more money, which is what we're doing in, in Canada. People who have more money are basically supporting the, the, the people in the middle class and, and lower income Canadians 
through this system because the richest among us don't receive money back from the federal government because they can afford to, 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 to take the impact of, uh, of pricing. So, and, and that's, I was on stage with, with, with the, the Environment Minister of Chile, for example, when we launched that, 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 that carbon pricing challenge. And, and she said that, you know, that's, that, that's one of the very interesting elements of, of what Canada is doing on on pricing, uh, on pricing pollution. And, and yet there is, uh, as you probably know, a Leger poll out now. It was conducted online, but it states that 77% of people surveyed want a freeze on the current carbon price as a response to inflation. What does that tell you about the public support for the policy here in Canada when measured against more bread and butter issues like food, housing, and heating that people are having to pay for? I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, being in Egypt, I haven't seen uh, that that poll, so I, I can't comment on it. Um, but uh, we've we've fought the last three federal elections, where pricing pollution was not the only issue on, on the ballot box, but clearly one of the issues on 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 on, on the ballot box. Um, and 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 as Canadians um, start four times a year receiving checks from the federal government to help them face face the impact. Of, uh, of inflation while fighting pollution at the same time. Because I think if we were to do a poll asking Canadians, do you think Canada should be doing its part to fight climate change? Do you think you would like to do your part to fight climate change? I suspect that the, the level of support for something like that would also be very high. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there does uh, continue to be about criticism when it comes back to COP27, criticism for the number of oil and gas companies who are present at the conference, reportedly over 600 representatives, many of them going as part of the official Canadian delegation. What do you say to the criticism of the presence of those companies? Canada is an open and democratic society. Uh, we, we do have two representatives of oil and gas sector on the Canadian delegation, but we have youth on, on the Canadian delegation. We have Indigenous youth. We have Indigenous leaders. We have trade union leaders. We have environmental organizations. In a society like ours, I think, you know, it's a very slippery slope when the government starts saying, well, it's okay for you to come, but it's not okay for you. We're, we're, we're democratic and, and open or we're not. That being said, uh, the oil and gas sector has an important role to play, a key role to play in reducing carbon pollution in Canada. And, and, and I must, and I've said so publicly recently, I'm a bit disappointed by what I'm seeing right now in terms of their level of investment in the transition. They've, they've sent billions of dollars to their shareholders. They have the right to do that. But I'm, I'm, I, what I would like to see from them is investment to ensure that this industry has a future in a world where we will be consuming less and less oil, that those workers and those communities that depend on, on, on the oil and gas sector have a future. And we're putting our money where our mouth is. We've offered subsidies, tax breaks to help these companies make important investment. So I'm, I'm very eager to see them come to the table and, 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 and really work with us to, to help reduce pollution in Canada. Well, in addition to that, or to that in general, your government will be placing an emissions uh, cap on oil and gas sometime next That's year. That's correct. Uh, but as you know, environmental groups want that regulation, that cap to come out sooner. You've been on that side of the issue with Equiter. Why not move so sooner on putting a cap on oil and gas? I, frankly, I, I think this, this request from environmental organization is, is unreasonable, and, and they know that. They know that in a country like ours, when we want to adopt new laws or new regulations, we have to do consultations with provinces and territories. We have a, a constitutional duty to do that, as well as with ind indigenous people. We, but, but, but we also are happy to receive advice from environmental organizations, from experts, and from companies. And, and, and it takes time to do that. The last, the last piece of regulation that we published, Environment Canada, this year, took five years to develop. And, 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 and for me, that's too long. The commitment that I've made to environmental groups, to Canadians, to companies, is that going forward, the new piece of regulations that we will develop in Canada, we, our aim is to do that in two years, to cut in, to cut in half the time it takes. But we can't do that overnight. Um, in a society like ours, people have, have a right to express their views, and, and in some cases, a constitutional right. And, and we, need to, we, we need to proceed in a very lawful manner, and that's what we're doing. And 
in Canada. Okay, I appreciate what you're saying about consultation, but the goal, as stated by your own government, is to get to net zero within the next 30 years. But the latest climate change performance index that came out at this COP, it has Canada ranked fifth from the bottom, not far from uh, Kazakhstan, not far from Saudi Arabia. So how can you maintain that target if Canada, as compared to the rest of the world, is under-delivering? Well, I mean, one of the issues is that not much was done in terms of fighting climate change in Canada for a very long time. And, and we are playing catch up and I'm, I'm, I'm the first one to recognize it. Um, and, and many of the things that we're doing will take time. So we're investing $30 billion in transit. So they are right now 300 transit projects under construction in, 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 in the country. Now, you can't, like, like it's being done in Toronto, you can't construct a new subway line overnight. It's going to take a few years. There's a new light train uh, system being built in, in Montreal. It's going to come online next year. Um, same thing with, with electrification of, of our transportation system. We've announced, the federal government has announced 10 different deals worth $15 billion to transform Canada's auto sector to, to, to produce electric vehicles, to produce battery components for electric vehicles, to produce batteries. This is, this is happening now. So I, 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 I'm the first one to recognize we need to do more and, and we need to do it faster, but it's starting to happen in Canada. But we won't change our society overnight. It will take many years to, to, to get there. But you think we can still meet the goal by 2050? Oh, absolutely. Minister Guibault, thank you so much for the time. Thank you very much, Michael. Take care. Well, there continues to be fallout after that brief exchange between the Prime Minister and China's President Xi Jinping admonishing Trudeau in full view of the press for sharing details of a conversation the two had during the G20 in Indonesia. Everything we discuss is then leaked to the paper. That's not appropriate. Now, observers and those with more intimate knowledge say the exchange demonstrates how poor Canada-China relations are at this moment, and perhaps more troubling, the disdain with which Xi Jinping views Prime Minister Trudeau. For their thoughts on the matter, we're now joined by our strategist panel. Susan Smith is the principal of the Blue Sky Strategy Group. Tim Powers is the vice chairman of Summa Strategies, and Anne McGrath is the national director for the NDP. Hello to the three of you. Hi, Hi. Hello. Uh, Susan, I'm going to get you to start us out. Given the scolding the Prime Minister got, was it actually smart for him to share the details of the conversation or just ill-advised? So there's a term that many Canadians will be familiar with and many people who have democratic governments around the world. It's called readout. And that means that there's a, there's a reporting, a summary of what happened in conversations. And that's precisely what the Trudeau government did. We, you know, as a transparent democratic company country, he had a conversation with a, a leader and he shared details of that conversation. I think it's perfectly within the realm and the expectations of Canadians for that kind of information to be shared. President Xi, on the other hand, does not come from a free and democratic country. He didn't do the readout first. So I think what you saw was petulance on the part of President Xi. I don't think Canadians should read into it overly. If anything, I think if they care at all, I think they'll care that the, the Prime Minister did what's right, what's very Canadian. He was polite in the face of um, President Xi's bad manners. And uh, I think it's fine. We have lots of trading partners in the world, uh, a minor blip in the grand scheme of things. So I'm, I'm not worried about it at all. Uh, Tim, what's your take? Because, you know, the Prime Minister was under pressure to address potentially illegal activities that China has been committing in this country. That includes the so-called uh, Chinese police stations on Canadian soil, the allegations of the Chinese Communist Party interfering in elections here in Canada. All of that in the readout. What's your take on whether or not the Prime Minister should have shared the details? I think this is so frigging overblown, uh, and, and that may surprise you to hear that. Uh, Justin Trudeau and I have one thing in common. We both used to be bouncers at nightclubs, and uh, he did his best bouncing then, Michael, by not get, being intimidated, by not being thrown off by Xi Ping. I mean, that is such a staged act of intimidation. What was he supposed to do? Grab the Chinese leader by the lapels and shake him and say, you talk more nicely to me? Uh, Trudeau has a lot to answer for, yes, when it relates to Canada's position with China and what happened with the two Michaels, what's actually going on now. But I tell you what, I thought he did fine with this the other day. It was clearly staged. 
And there's something to be said when the, you know, one of the most powerful nations in the world feels it comes over and needs to come over and scold you. Maybe you are irritating them to a degree that that's pleasing. So I think this is just so overblown. I think he handled it the right way. And uh, short of shaking him by the lapels, I don't know what people expected him to do. Oh, okay, you think it's overblown. But, you know, Anne, I guess the question is whether the prime minister could have raised the issue with Xi uh, without sharing details with the press. What do you make of the decision? Well, th first of all, there are a lot of really critical issues between China and Canada right now. I mean, you know, my colleagues here have mentioned the two Michaels. I think that these reports about interference in elections are very concerning. And I think, uh, you know, we really need to find out what's going on there. And of course, there are discussions right now about how we trade, where we trade, with whom we trade, all of those kinds of things. So uh, really, really critical issues there. I would agree that I think that this particular incident is is overblown. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know Susan and Tim are right that that it is very common for there to be a read what's called a readout uh, after a meeting. Um, they're very uh, they're pretty unexciting. Most of them uh, they're about like less than half a page, and it just says usually says the two leaders met and these are the things that they talked about and they agreed to continue talking. That's basically what a readout does. And uh, so I, I don't see anything unusual or dramatic about the readout having been done. That is not leaking things to the press. It is a readout of a meeting. Um, the, the incident between the, the, the two leaders uh, at, at the event, I think, um, you know, was caught, caught on microphone and, and so forth. But I didn't think anything particularly dramatic happened at it, uh, uh, really. But I do think that Canada has a lot of work to do in terms of um, uh, developing a more, I believe, a more sophisticated relationship with China. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that would help for sure would be, uh, I think, if we had an ambassador. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which which has been named, uh, but you know, let's let's talk about though that part of the the admonishment, I guess, that the Canadian press says wasn't translated, and that's the part that uh, she apparently warns that if conversations were not respectful, then there could uh, be unpredictable results. Now, the Trudeau government is expected to release a new Indo-Pacific strategy. Do you think that comment is a bit of a shot across the bow? Uh, and I guess picking up on your point earlier, Susan, doesn't even does it even matter? Yeah. It, um, no, look, President Xi was posturing. Uh, you can sure bet that he doesn't walk places where there are cameras present unless he completely wants to to uh, send a message to the folks back home. I Like I said, I don't think Canadians are terribly fussed by and probably happy with how Pres uh, Prime Minister Trudeau handled it with President Xi. Um, we are waiting for an Indo-Pacific strategy. We've been waiting a while for one. We need one. But there's a reason we need one and we will have one is because there are other democratic rules-based trading nations in the world. Um, the biggest one is about to be India. And we as a country continue to be a trading nation. We've had signals from our, our deputy prime minister. We've had signals from our foreign affairs minister that our preference is to do business with countries uh, who we can trust, who follow the rules-based order and uh, where we can grow uh, successfully and uh, grow our business with them, grow our trade with them, and and grow our relationships with them. So I think it's a signal that there's a pivot coming. In terms of whether President, uh, you know, President uh, Xi thinks things need to be polite, I would remind everybody, and it drives me crazy every time I see it. We frequently have Chinese ambassadors who are guests to Canada coming on national news or giving news conferences where they're exceptionally critical of the Canadian government on our home soil. So from a manners-based approach, I don't think the Canadians need any lessons from the Chinese. From a trade-based approach, I think it's only prudent that as a country, we are constantly um, refreshing our trade uh, and our, our global relations perspective uh, on a prudent and a prudent basis that looks forward. And certainly um, a new Indo-Pacific strategy will be well-timed and definitely needed and a signal of things to come. Tim? Look, I, I, there's so much said about the strategy. My bigger concern out of all of this, and, and it's not so much the, the Xi incident, as I said, I actually think the prime minister handled that as well as he could. Uh, apart from physically throttling him, which was never an option, Michael. Um, but it, it is, you know, where does where does this leave Canada and the lack of, co of clear policy at the moment with our Five Eyes allies? 
because I think there is a criticism there, and I think it's legitimate. Um, the prime minister in his early days, before he became prime minister, as you know, spoke with a bit more fondness about China. Uh, he's not in some quarters being seen as aggressive with China. Maybe we are behind the scenes and we don't know. Our bigger concern ought to be with our allies and less the Chinese. Our key five ally, are the, the five eyes. How are the five eyes viewing the Canadian relationship with China? Do they view us as being in the court of the five eyes? Or still a little too much in terms of our uncertainty with the relationship with China? That's what I'm more concerned about, not about how China views us, but our allies. China is always going to do what is best for China first. That has been their history. We should not expect any departure from it. Canada should take a similar approach, but in concert with its allies. And uh, final word to you. So she is obviously in a, a pretty strengthened position domestically coming out of there, coming out of the Congress, and in all likelihood is sort of feeling a little bit of uh, wind in his sails, uh, and, and took the opportunity to try and um, try and put uh, the Prime Minister of Canada in his place, and I think it failed. Um, so, uh, you know, as others have said here, I think that what we should be doing is focusing, we, we need to figure out what our relationship with China is. We need to be very strong on the issues of foreign in interference, for sure. Um, and we need to look at uh, who are the other partners in the region uh, that we can develop stronger relationships with, places like India, Japan, et cetera. Okay, well, that is all the time that we actually have. But thank you to the three of you for joining us uh, this week once again. Susan Smith, Tim Powers, and Anne McGrath. Good to see you three. Good to see you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you. Well, he's back. Donald Trump announcing this past week that he will be running for the Republican nomination in hopes of being the U.S. president once again in 2024. And in his speech, he even cited Canada. Take a listen. Every nation took advantage of our country. We rene renegotiated deals with Mexico and Canada, USMCA. We got rid of the worst trade deal ever made, ever made, NAFTA, the worst trade deal ever made. That's why the farmers love Trump, because we did a great job. Well, to talk about Trump's announcement, we're now joined by David Leventhal in Washington, deputy editor for The Insider. Dave, nice to see you. Hey, good to see you, Michael. Listen, uh, talk to us about this announcement. So much to really talk about, but given how harshly Donald Trump has been criticized in the wake of the U.S. midterm elections, I'm wondering about the reaction. What has it been to, to his announcing that he will be running again? First of all, Michael, the announcement itself was about as surprising as the sun rising this morning. We knew Donald Trump was going to run for president. He had been telegraphing it pretty much since he left the White House in January of 2021. And when he finally did announce and, and he made his big announcement uh, as he's been previewing for so long, it was really kind of just playing the hits. He talked a lot about the past. He pointed backwards in his comments very often. And, and the reaction to it has sort of been muted, even among many Republicans who would identify themselves as tried and true Trump supporters or supporters of Trumpism, but were relatively nonplussed. Well, I'm wondering why that is, because, you know, even the New York Post, famously pro-Trump before uh, 2020, reported on the announcement by saying, uh, quote, a Florida retiree has decided to run for U.S. president. How seriously is Donald Trump being taken within Republican circles right now? Republicans have a majorly bad taste in their mouth right now because of the results of the midterm elections here in the United States. Had there been a, a huge win, had uh, Republicans won both the U.S. House, which they have won, but also the U.S. Senate and overperformed in terms of their expectations for themselves, we might be having a different conversation right now. But Donald Trump, let's remember, he did not really deliver in 2018 in midterm congressional elections. He obviously lost the 2020 election himself. And here in 2022, as the leader of the Republican Party, it, it underperformed. It really did not reach the expectations that the party had set for itself. So there have been some calls from some Republicans who are being a little bit more outspoken than they have been in the past, saying maybe we got to look elsewhere. Maybe we got to look for a younger generation, somebody who, yeah, is saying all the same kinds of things of Donald Trump, but is not actually named Donald J. Trump. Oh, well, when you say that, of course, uh, the Florida governor is very much on the lips of many Republicans right now. Without question. So Ron DeSantis, that Florida governor, 
very much at the top of the list of many Republicans as somebody who could potentially challenge Donald Trump in a Republican primary, which, mind you, we're talking more than a year away before anyone is going to cast any meaningful vote in the race to become Republican nominee for president in 2024. But he's not the only one. There are other Republicans, too. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, former Vice President Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, the former ambassador to the UN, Tim Scott, a senator from South Carolina, the list goes on and on. And all of them have been making noises to one extent or another about the possibility that they too will jump into this race. So really, Michael, the big question right now is not, uh, is anyone going to challenge Donald Trump, but who is gonna challenge Donald Trump and how many will? Well, you know, the political story aside, I'm also wondering about judicial challenges, Dave, because Donald Trump, he does continue to be the subject of a number of criminal investigations. So what impact will his run have on those? How much do those investigations have to do with his decision to run? Well, we're, we're really getting into unprecedented territory here and, and struggling for any type of historical analog or parallel to point to because Donald Trump just simply is unlike any other presidential candidate before. We only have, first of all, one president in the U.S. history, Grover Cleveland, who ever ran for president, won, then lost, then served a non-consecutive second term. That's what Donald Trump is trying to do and make history in that regard. But the legal cloud that looms over him is massive and it's multi-pronged. There are cases, be them civil cases or criminal investigations that are active, that are pending, and, and that could really loom over Donald Trump, not only for the next year or two, but the rest of his life. So we're looking at a situation where if Donald Trump was to win the nomination, there are all sorts of sundry scenarios about, could Donald Trump serve well under indictment? Could he run as a presidential candidate while facing prison terms? I mean, these are really the conversations that some Republicans especially are gnashing their teeth and wringing their hands over wondering, well, you know, do we really need this kind of drama? And how could anyone like that win in a general election, even against a Democrat who people are enthrilled about? It's not exactly, uh, you know, the rosiest scenario here. Dave, always good to speak with you on this. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. And that's David Leventhal, deputy editor of The Insider. With inflation at near historic highs, Canadians, as we know, are struggling right now to pay for food, gas and housing. It's an issue this country's largest private sector union took up as it lobbied federal politicians this week, urging Ottawa to introduce new programs to help out working Canadians. Lana Payne is the president of Unifor. She joins us right now. Ms. Payne, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So here you are in Ottawa, as we said, talking about your budget priorities for 2023, 2024, but you're also talking a lot about affordability. Uh, talk to us about that priority. Why are you discussing affordability? Really, what are you bringing to the table that politicians don't already know? Well, I think there's a, there's a mood in the country right now, particularly am, among working people, where they've gone through, like everybody has, this, you know, really a humongous crisis the pandemic and you know we come out of that people are struggling there's anxiety then we get high inflation and now we're getting skyrocketing interest rates which is causing a great deal of uncertainty out there and you know the possibility of these latest moves uh, by the bank of canada shifting us into a recession and we're already seeing some impacts of this particularly in some of the sectors where unifor uh, represents working people and, you know, how much more pain can workers take? A pandemic and then a recession. I think we need to take a step back, analyze, you know, have a proper conversation about re what really is uh, causing these problems with inflation. Because I think the medicine that currently is being prescribed by the Bank of Canada is, is not what we need to be doing. Okay, build on that. Because you are pointing out the fact that when you look at the causes of inflation right now, it's arguably less domestic and more yes, foreign. Yes, absolutely. And in our experience, when you look at some of the nations who went in to basically raising their rates earlier and fast, 
uh, their inflation has not come down because it's not addressing things like global supply chains. It's not changing the war in Russia or, or the war in the Ukraine. It's so, so, you know, piling on this pain on top of working people right now, uh, is that really the smart thing we want to do? We want to be able to make sure people have good jobs, that they're able to lift themselves up at this moment in time with a tightening labor market. We've been able to do incredible things at the bargaining table as a result of this. Um, but you know, not keeping pace with inflation, wages, all of those things for 30 years, and you finally get a moment when you can do it, and we have the bank swiping in, uh, to, swooping in to do these things. So it's, it's a very big challenge right now. Well, in fact, you, you accuse the bank of engaging in class warfare right now. Yes, I, I know, uh, probably uh, hard terms for the bank to hear, but the reality is, is that they're politicizing what they're doing. They had uh, a, the, the governor of the Bank of Canada made a statement, you know, many weeks ago in which he, you know, advised employers, you know, don't worry about it, don't raise wages, don't get caught into these, you know, putting inflation into long-term contracts. I'm like, come on. And then the second thing after that last week, you know, basically saying the only way we're going to solve inflation is through unemployment. What does he expect the labor movement and unions to say in response to that? Our job is to protect working people. And I actually don't think central bankers know what they're doing right now. I think they're hoping that by, you know, raising interest rates, it's going to have an impact. Well, hope is not good enough, and they're causing a lot of damage with these actions. So it's like, take a step back. Let's look at what is truly happening out there. And, uh, you know, I'm very concerned that we, if we in, head into a recession right now, it, it's it's going to be very tough for a lot of people in Canada. Okay, let, let's take a step back as well, because if what you are saying is that the, the this this current policy doesn't work, does it not run the risk of creating domestic inflationary pressures? If, for example, we we, we allow or or the bank allows uh, inflation to be at the rate it is, if everybody bumps up salaries for employees, does that not then permanently make the high prices people are struggling with right now? permanently high. I think there's an equilibrium there and also you have to start thinking about where these high prices are coming from. There's another part of this which the Bank of Canada refuses to talk about and that's the corporate profiteering that's happening right now. I mean if you look at the second quarter of 2022 corporate profits in Canada were at the highest level ever at 25 percent share of GDP. Previous like before the pandemic five years leading into it the average was 15 percent. This is a huge problem, which is why some of the things we're saying to politicians this week is they have to find a way to capture some of that wealth and return it back to Canadians. We're doing our job at the collective bargaining table. They have to do more as well. So in terms of policy, in terms of what you hope your meetings, because it's a week worth of meetings with, yes. I believe, about 100 MPs while you're in Ottawa, what do you hope comes out of it in practical terms? Well, there's a number of things that they can do. Fixing EI certainly is really important, especially if we're heading into a recession. We have to have a robust program to support workers. So it in applies their... to more people than it currently exactly. does. Exactly. Um, and obviously around the corporate profit side, it's really important that they look at, for example, the excess uh, profit tax that is currently applied to financial institutions and banks. They could put that on other sectors of the economy, capture some of that wealth, return it to, for example, low-income Canadians in targeted programming, and it could really help a lot with the, the fact that low-income folks deal with inflation and are impacted by it more than more than others. So we could. There are things that we could do here, and uh, without using the sledgehammer of of higher interest rates against everybody. Uh, very quickly, losing time here. Is your message catching on? Do you think? We've had some really great conversations actually with with MPs uh, from all across uh, from every single party, and uh, I think they understand too the moment we're in. Uh, the problem becomes what are the solutions, and so that's what we've been doing this week, well, this week giving them solutions. Okay. Lana Payne, thank you for taking the time today. Thanks so much. Two former ministers lent their voices to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch this week. Alan Rock and Lloyd Axworthy speaking out about the detention of refugees in provincial jails. Now, according to Amnesty International Canada, tens of thousands of people, including children and refugee claimants, have been incarcerated over the last 10 years. Individuals seeking refuge in Canada who were instead locked up even though none were facing criminal charges. 
That included Abdelhamid El Mahdi, who came to Canada looking for protection and who ended up spending months in prison not understanding why and unable to hear or communicate with authorities. I spent most of my time in, in jail in silence because I was only provided with one hearing aid at a time and only for the CBSA meetings and hearings. The batteries would run out after a few hours. I was repeatedly handcuffed and strip searched. This was absolutely humiliating and terrifying. And I had no idea why I was there. I just cried. Well, joining us now is the former Justice Minister, Alan Rock. Alan Rock, nice to see you again. Michael, it's nice to be here. So, you know, I think this practice of incarcerating refugees, many Canadians know this happens, many others do not. Just how commonplace is this practice? Well, far too commonplace. The report published last year by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International jointly documented uh, over 10,000 cases of people being held in detention um, pending the determination of their legal status. So it's very widespread and so many lives have been touched and frankly uh, affected uh, very deeply as a result of this practice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get into that in, in, in a moment, but talk to us about the kind of facilities that individuals are held in and for how long are they held in these essentially jails? Well, um, what happens is when you present at the border and the border agency um, asks for your legal status and they're not satisfied that you had the status to be in Canada, then uh, you can be released until there's a hearing or you can be detained. It's entirely in the discretion of the border, border agency, Michael. Um, the government of Canada has created three holding centers in Ontario, Quebec and British Columbia, which have about 370 beds total they're like uh, minimum security uh, prisons. Uh, there's some supervision, but it's not as bad as being in jail. However, in too many cases, the border agency decides that instead of having you in a federal holding facility, they're going to use the agreement the federal government has with the provinces to hold you in a provincial jail. And the trouble with that is um, the agency has no power over the conditions in which you're kept in the jails. The jails in the provinces are, are created for people accused of or convicted of crime. In the case of immigration detention, there's no time limit as to how long you can be kept. So, for example, the report from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International documented over 300 cases since 2016 of people held longer than a year in immigration detention. So if you're held for an indeterminate period in a provincial jail where you can be held in uh, solitary confinement, uh, you're locked up with people accused of or convicted of crime, what comes out of that is gross human rights violations, completely unjust practices. And as you refer to off top there, real practical impacts, the type of trauma it inflicts on these individuals, which I think which shocked many Canadians who see Canada as this place of refuge for people around the world. Talk to us about the kind of stories that you've heard about the effects this type of incarceration has. Well, it's resulted in suicide attempts on the part of those who are locked up indefinitely in provincial jails, who've done, who committed no crime, accused of no crime, and feel hopeless, feel they, they don't know how or when they're ever going to be able to get out. And there have been cases where there have been suicide attempts. Indeed, there have been suicides. And uh, there have been coroner's inquests looking into some of these deaths. But ev even for those who survive the experience, it often is a traumatizing period, uh, which makes them fearful of authority in Canada, which makes them fearful of police because they don't know if they're going to be pulled over again and detained for no reason that they can understand. So the testimony of the people who've been through this awful experience is quite harrowing. Just today at the news conference, we had two individuals 
who experienced just that, who were thrown into provincial jails without understanding why, who were being kept for who knows how long. The man who spoke this morning said he spent three months in provincial jail in British Columbia with ha without having any idea when he'd be able to, uh, to leave. Mm -hmm. And yes, it does have a huge emotional and psychological impact on the people who endure it. Are these security concerns that leads to the incarceration of these individuals, uh, are those valid security concerns? The 94% of the cases of people being detained by CBSA are on the grounds of flight risk, meaning we're worried that if we release you into the community, you won't turn up for your hearing to determine your legal status. So that's 88%. And a few other percentages come from CBSA not being completely satisfied with your documents. So hardly a security risk. These are people who pose no threat that can be demonstrated. And in fact, the odd thing, Michael, is that in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, when the pandemic arrived, there were over 9,600 people detained for immigration purposes, either in provincial jails or holding centers. CBSA released all but 1,600 of them into the community because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, there's proof positive that you release you know, 8,000 people and the sky didn't fall. There were no reports of community endangerment, no public safety issues, no crime. So the using flight risk as an excuse to detain someone, we say, is far too broad a discretion. It should be challenged. It should be supervised. The CBSA has among the strongest police powers of any public security agency in the country, and it's the only public security agency not subject to independent civilian oversight. And it's high time there be effective oversight on these decisions. Now, the news conference that you took part in launches 12 days of action to try to raise the awareness about this issue uh, with federal politicians. So what would you like to see happen instead of what's currently taking place? Four of the 10 provinces have already ripped up the agreement with Ottawa, allowing Ottawa to use its provin their provincial jails for immigration detention. What we, what we ask the government of Canada is, do we have to wait until the, f the other provinces rip up the agreements? Or will Ottawa show leadership that's required, step out in front of this and say, we're going to end this practice right now? So what we want to see is the government of Canada taking the leadership required to bring this practice to an end. It can do it progressively. It can ease into a new way of doing things, but it must end. And Michael, there are literally hundreds of community facilities across the country that are available to support and to look after people while they're awaiting their hearing. You don't have to put them in prison. Just commit them to a community agency which is available have them stay in touch with that agency, have them then appear for their hearing when, when their hearing occurs. Um, and I, I dare say the vast majority of people would, would attend those hearings. There are also technologies available now mm -hmm. which permit the authorities to keep in touch with people uh, while they're awaiting their hearing without them being detained. Alan Rock, good to speak with you again. Thank you for being here. Michael, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this important issue. Well, as we wrap up this weekend show, we did want to take one more look at the Public Order Emergency Commission. This upcoming week will be the last week of testimony for the Commission and scheduled to appear will be the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and other members of Cabinet. So for a look ahead, we're now once again reaching out to Joanna Smith, Ottawa Bureau Chief for the Canadian Press and Marsha McLeod, a reporter with The Globe and Mail. So uh, a big week ahead, Joanna, I'll get you to start us out here. What are you watching out for? All the cabinet ministers who are all at the meetings, we've gotten this rare look to read some of their text messages and emails and transcripts and notes of their conversations with each other in secret. That's a pretty rare thing. So I think just as a keen observer of politics, I'm interested in, in seeing what they have to say. I'm interested in, in seeing Prime Minister Justin Trudeau take the stand and, and see him in, a, in an environment where we're not used to seeing him. Of course, we're 
asking him questions all the time, but he's known for being pretty good at staying on message and hard to knock off track, except for, you know, some notable exceptions. But you see this in an environment with commission lawyers really, really grilling him on a particular question over a long period of time. I'm really hoping we're getting some information. And, and the information I'm, I'm looking most closely for is a sense of who, who was nervous? What, you know, Lucky was texting with her counterpart at the Ontario Provincial Police about Kevin Misters getting really nervous, her, her needing to calm them down. They were seeing bouncy castles in the streets outside Parliament Hill. I want to know who was pushing for the Emergencies Act? Whose decision was this ultimately end of the day? And why? Was it, was it really needed? Or was this a case of things just having been so badly mismanaged for more than two weeks by this point, by, by everyone, including the local Ottawa police, that it became necessary only because people didn't do what they should have been doing from day one to prevent it from getting that bad? So that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Marsha, how about you? What, what exactly are you going to keep a keen eye out for? I mean, one thing off the jump that I'm really going to be listening for is the degree to which or not these various ministers um, invoke any cabinet confidence. We know that some cabinet confidence has been waived. So, for instance, um, what are called inputs to confidence are allowed to be discussed, but cabinet discussions, um, it, it's not been waived. And when that started coming up a little bit in, in um, Ms. Thomas's testimony yesterday, the National Security and Intelligence Advisor. Um, and, and But what I am really most interested in, I think, is uh, Justice Minister David Lametti. Um, and, and hearing from him, um, as Thomas was saying, you're going to hear from the lawyers about the legal standard that the government was using when it decided that it met the threshold to invoke the act. And, and so I want to hear from him, what was the government looking at when it decided it met the legal standard, if not... Uh, the CSIS Act, which is what is laid out in the Act and which CSIS has said was not met. Um, I'm also really interested to hear from uh, Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino. Um, he said that they heard from law enforcement that they met the legal standard to invoke the Act. RCMP Brenda Lucky says she never advised on that. So those are some things I'm going to be looking out for. Well, without a doubt, a big week ahead. Thank you for setting that up. Uh, Joanna Smith, Ottawa Bureau Chief for the Canadian Press. Marsha McLeod, reporter for the Globe and Mail. Thank you very much for this weekend. Thanks for having Thank me, you. Michael. And that is our program for you. I'm Michael Serapio. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. We will see you again tomorrow.